Let's now go over to uh, John McManus, and I'd love for uh, Tracy at certain points to please uh, interject. Uh, the two of you have been absolutely essential in supporting the efforts of health policy and, and political affairs. So glad you could be on the program tonight and to share with us and with this uh, remarkable content that you've put together, because this is really what everybody's trying to understand. How can they uh, uh, use this to maintain their economic viability in these very, very challenging times? So John, please take it away. Sure, thanks for having me here. Um, there's two major programs that the bill um, creates, which could be a resource for our practices. Most significantly is the $349 billion Small Business Paycheck Protection Program. That provides loans up to uh, $10 million per firm, as long as uh, that firm has less than 500 employees for firms that were adversely impacted by COVID. So I think all of our practices would easily qualify since their patient volume went down so significantly um, with all the healthcare warnings and so forth. Um, and the second program is $100 billion in grants from the Health Emergency Fund, emergency appropriations, really for the direct treatment of uh, COVID patients um, and the infrastructure that, that would require, including uh, surge infrastructure. So the program, the, the small business program, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, they're gonna start pumping money out almost immediately. Uh, this house is gonna vote on the bill Tomorrow, I, I would wager this president would sign it and we'll see regulations um, very shortly, probably next week on that, on how to access. And it, it goes through lenders backed by the federal government. The good news for our practices is if you um, hire back your staff uh, by June, these loans turn into grants. In other words, you don't have to pay them back at all. Um, it's rather a complicated formula on how it works, but they look at what, how many employees you had as of February 15th of this year, um, and then take another snapshot at June 30th. So you're basically not penalized because I think, I think Congress and, and uh, the administration understood that many businesses, restaurants, your practices, other businesses are severely impacted by the economic shutdown. <laughs> Um, laid off staff, you can you 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 can uh, bring them back on board, and and you'll as long as you get them back on by June, you'll receive a uh, prorated amount um, for 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 those costs. So, for example, uh, they'll cover up to one hundred thousand dollars per person prorated um, for that two and a half month period, um, and other business expenses, rent, mortgage utilities, uh, contractors, debt obligations, all of that could also be uh, forgiven as legitimate uh, expenses. Uh, one significant wrinkle, you can't decrease any employee's salary by more than 25% um, from the most recent uh, quarter of employment. Um, if, for example, you brought back, let's say you, you had a practice with 100 employees, and by June, you brought you were back up to 80. You would get 80% of your um, debt forgiven for salaries up to $100,000. If you brought them all back, um, they would look at a rolling average of those months, and you you would get a, a proportional uh, grants provided for that. But it it is a fixed pot of money, $349 billion of money. So it's very important that we get our applications in there quickly. Uh, we're gonna provide some recommendations over the next week of people who can help write these applications, working with uh, your, your practices. Um, uh, and those have to be provided by June 30th. Of course, the money starts going at the door. Um, there is a prioritization of loans um, in the statute. Entities serving underserved areas, businesses in rural markets, veterans, minority-owned businesses, women, new businesses that have been in operation for less than two years. I mean, this isn't focused on healthcare exclusively. It could be any type of small business up to 500 employees. There's just a, um, uh, uh, another proviso because it's the greater of uh, 500 employees or certain economic limitations, correct? And also, can you clarify that for our medical practices that have 
over 500 employees, this is a little problematic for us, correct? Yes. Um, if you have more than 500 employees, you can't qualify unless you're um, in an industry designated by the Small Business um, Administration um, with, 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 with a different designation. And because they don't provide a number of employees for physician practices or inventory surgery centers, we don't meet that escape valve. So for example, they have designations for uh, greeting card industry, restaurants, uh, all kinds of different types of businesses, but that doesn't help us. So unfortunately, if, if you're in a firm larger than 500, I know Dr. Kapoor, uh, your practice is, is, is one of those, they would not receive assistance under this program. So we'd have to focus all of our efforts for those larger practices on the $100 billion uh, in grants provided in the emergency fund. John, before we get to the grant fund, if I could just add, I think there were a couple of points that you, you stated that are worth reiterating and highlighting. The SBA loan pot of money is really not all dedicated to the healthcare sphere. And because there are existing mechanisms in place, SBA loans have been in existence for quite some time, the ability to get that money out the door should flow fairly quickly. And so to John's earlier point, you are going to see regulations come out of these agencies in very short order. So we will obviously try to provide some, some recommendations for assistance, but people should be thinking about how best to write these uh, loan applications to fit the needs based on uh, the criteria listed um, in these bills. I think that, that um, you know, having that infrastructure is really critical because when John s next explains the grant pot of money, that is a wholly new operation and a mechanism that doesn't currently exist and therefore could take additional times, even though everybody recognizes the urgency of the situation, it could take a little more time to actually push that money out. Um, I think everybody's uh, going to be wondering, uh, with this pot of money that's been designated, uh, really how far can that go, $349 billion versus the need, when it is uh, covering, you know, all of the restaurants and gyms and physician practices? I mean, is this really, I think uh, practices really have to think about this, because before they count on government relief, um, they, they should you know, and retain staff that they otherwise might furlough, I think we need to really consider how adequate this uh, measure will be across industries. Gary, that's a great question. And I think it's important to note that this is a $2 trillion package. And while that is the largest in our nation's history in terms of an economic stimulus package, it when you break it down, and just as you pointed out, it's $349 billion for just these small businesses alone. When you're having every industry across the country try to tap into these, the, the concern is that all of these pots of money are going to be depleted fairly quickly. So I'm, I'm frightened to tell you that folks have already talked about another future uh, coronavirus relief package. It's hard to even talk about that as we haven't finished and completed our action legislatively on this one. But I do think there will be a, an ability, hopefully, to reassess in the coming weeks, depending on how quickly these funds are depleted. Um, there could, unfortunately, be the need to try to um, increase these pots of money down the road. Yeah, I mean, one thing to keep in mind, this is the third legislative package on this issue. And it's been around for what, three weeks, four weeks. Um, but Congress will go home for, we think, an extended period here, in part because they're on lockdown as well for uh, the next uh, six weeks, probably. And then we probably have a fourth package, um, which may be, you know, people see where these things are going. Have they run out of money on this Paycheck Protection Small Business Program? Where are they on that? Do we need a more specific fix uh, along the lines of some of the issues we were working on with Senator Barrasso and Bennett? Um, there was more focus on uh, physician practices and amateur surgery centers uh, rather than these larger. But this was trying to get money out the door for, for those who were in free fall. And I think our practices met that profile. Uh, but great question, Gary. We don't know. What's going to happen? And you have until June to figure out what, whether these loans get, get forgiven or not. So you don't have to hire everybody next week. They, they understand that um, this, is, this is complicated and it takes time for you guys to make decisions on how you run your businesses. 
there was a, a wide recognition, particularly in the hospital community, that resources were needed immediately and that the old way of getting money out the door of plussing up payment rates on Medicare and Medicaid um, DRGs would not be sufficient. So there was a hundred billion dollar fund created in the bill. It was originally 75 billion in the, in the first um, version we saw and it got plussed up to, to 100 billion um, to prevent, prepare for and respond to the coronavirus and to reimburse providers for healthcare related expenses, including lost revenue attributable to the virus. Okay. So people often talk about this as a hospital fund. We fought hard to make sure that other healthcare providers like physicians would be eligible. So, and they, and they clearly are in the statute. Um, the language is very directive though. It's, it talks about building or, or construction of temporary structures, leasing properties, medical supplies and equipment, PPE, which we know your practices are buying a lot of, retrofitting facilities. We know there's a discussion now at HHS with the ambulatory surgery center industry of how can we take some of those and convert them into, into taking some of these patients for patient overflow in New York and other areas where we're seeing surge. Um, these funds cannot be used if you're getting uh, reimbursed from other parties. So you can't bill uh, an insurance carrier or a Medicare um, and then try to get funds for the same purpose. This has to be outside of that. And that's why it's really more focused on infrastructure type thing. Um, we don't know how the application process will operate exactly yet, but we think they're going to hand it off to a Medicare contractor as they do with your billing system now. Um, and we're going to get guidance from the secretary probably as early as next week, I would imagine. Um, and, and, uh, we need to get the loan applications in right away. Um, for the distribution of funds, uh, the language provides a lot of flexibility to the secretary, whether it could be prepayment, prospective payment, retrospective payment. So people are, they, keep, they basically say, keep your receipts and we'll figure it out later. Um, but if, if you need funds right away, we're, we're going to try to get them out to you. Um, obviously, there's going to be some auditing of the program and, and, and findings to Congress on, on, on how well it worked. So this is a wholly new program. It's never been operated before. I think it's going to be much more difficult logistically to, to, to get the money out than, than the uh, small business program. And I do think the way you, when you look at the language is tilted more at the hospital. So we just have to be very creative, particularly those firms who can't qualify for, uh, for the small business program on how we write our applications and making sure we're fitting into the spirit of the law, which is you're, you're, you're helping address the COVID crisis. Tracy and John, um, the issue of sequestration, which has been ongoing for, for many years now, how will that be addressed during this current health economic crisis? The bill suspends the 2% payment cut. You guys see on all your procedures and um, uh, activities for May 1 to, to the end of the year. We did that earlier, but I think the CMS technical team asked that it be done at that time period. So that will be some relief, particularly um, expensive products like Part B drugs. It'll give you a bit more breathing room. Well, thank you, John. That was tremendous. This is obviously for all who are listening and following this pandemic and this health policy crisis is so multi-layered, incredibly complex, but yet we're making progress. And none of this would have been uh, um, beneficial to the independent practice of medicine and urology without the, you know, the, the exceptional efforts of the LUGPA health policy and political affairs team. And I, I can't thank the four of you enough for doing all that you've done. It's pretty clear to me that there's a lot more education that needs to ensue. There's still a lot of questions that haven't been answered. More of it's coming. There'll probably be more legislation as you've already alluded to. Uh, thank you all so much. Let me just, maybe if you, want to each have a, some final closing comments. I'm going to start with you, Gary. Well, Neil, thank you. And I appreciate the uh, call out for um, our advocacy and health policy work, which as Deke has pointed out, is largely over, you know, to a large extent overlapping. And um, I think, you know, we've seen some communication from uh, certain um, elements of the Congress uh, internally and externally 
that specifically mention physician practices being eligible for the small business uh, administration loans. And uh, we believe uh, that it is uh, possible that uh, that specific call out would not have been uh, done without our um, active intervention. So we're grateful to the Congress uh, for recognizing the plight that independent uh, medical providers are in today. Uh, thank you, Neil. And again, uh, this has uh, been a, uh, a very informative uh, dialogue, and I commend uh, my co-panelists for really condensing very complicated material into a very short period of time. Um, this isn't done yet. Uh, we don't know exactly when um, when things are, um, are are going to peak, but clearly this is the first step uh it's going to be really important that everybody gets their act together relatively quickly uh be, uh, particularly for that 349 billion for those that are eligible for it because that's the whole country and so uh it really behooves people that's an easier route and uh most physician practices will fall under that aegis so i i would urge people to take that route first and get their ducks in a row so to speak so uh, so as soon as the guidance comes out, they're ready to go in uh, first in line. Well, it's been a great working with you guys. Um, I think we had an, an impact here for, for independent practice in medicine and just to convey the gravity of the situation. And it's good to see we're going to get some results out of this. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah, thanks. I, I would love to just say thank you to Dr. Shore and Kirsch and Kapoor for all that you do um, for LUGPA and, and to help support us. We, we are so grateful to be part of this team. And to everyone watching, I just want to say thank you for all you guys are doing. You're on the front lines. We, we know how, how challenging this is um, for all of you. And we just, you know, we appreciate everything you do and we thank you and be safe. So with that, thank you all so much. I, I have a favor to ask of you. You've presented an enormous amount of accomplishment work uh, through uh, a teamwork of dedication and expertise. And I sure hope we can get you back and, and have uh, some additional conference calls on this and education. It benefits clearly not only the members of, of LUGPA, but really the entire uh, House of Urology. So thank you very, very much.